His nurse, his wife, his daughter, and two sons are with him. He asks for two witnesses other than his family to be present. And a recorder to be in place to record his last wishes. When all is ready, he begins to speak. My son, T-Boat, I want you to take the Mayfair houses. My daughter, Jolene, you take the apartments over at the East End. My son, Abair, I want you to take the offices over in the city center. Marie, my dear wife, please take all the residential buildings on the banks of the river. The nurse and witnesses are blown away as they did not realize his extensive holdings. And as Boudreaux slips away, the nurse says, Miss Boudreaux, your husband must have been a hard-working man to have accumulated all this property. Marie replies, property? That sorry son of a gun had a newspaper route. <laughs> now, there are young people in here that ain't got no idea what I'm just talking about. And there'll come a day, all you'll remember is you had a newspaper on your phone. You know, it's, it's just the time we're living in. Got your Bibles? We're going to be using them just a little bit. 1 Samuel chapter 21. 1 Samuel chapter 21. I'll be there in just a minute. I, I want to talk to you about something that, that uh, uh, Isaiah 28.10. Go, go to the first, very first slide, Cheryl. The, the, the very first one. Very first one. Isaiah. Uh, from place to place. This is what I realize that life is. Uh, I didn't put the scripture here, but I'll give it to you somewhere in the Bible. Isaiah chapter 28.10. Isaiah 28, 10 tells us that life is line upon line, precept upon precept, from glory to glory. We sang a song from glory to glory a while ago, and we, we talked about how God's glory goes up and up. Well, I believe it's the, the will of God that our lives actually uh, mirror this, line upon line. You know, when you're going through uh, it's first grade, second grade, third grade, you're moving line upon line, precept upon precept. In other words, Scripture upon Scripture. You're learning a little bit every day. You're, you, you, you're moving up. Everybody say up. I just watched that cartoon movie with my grandkids, Up, and I realized that, that God is always calling us out. He's calling us up. He's calling us closer to Him. And from place to place, from glory to glory, it's the will of God that we just keep moving up. Amen. And precept upon precept is learning Scripture, gaining victory, victory after victory. Life is from place to place. Sometimes one place looks a total different than the last place. When I think about uh, Bishop, Bishop Miller had taught me years ago that God is preparing us for what he has prepared for us. That everything that we're going through right now is preparing us for something else that we haven't going on in life. And you're wondering, oh, God, what are you, you must have something really great for me. Because you sure have been preparing me for something here. When I walk through and I look, for example, somebody had bottomed out. A very successful young man who had a cool staff, a collection of bear claws and lion's teeth, a newly acquired rather large sword. This young man had a new hit record that people were singing all over Israel. Saul has killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. The song went platinum overnight. It was an amazing time for David's life. And, and then David, when you understand his, his place in life, he was anointed by the prophet Samuel to be king. He was chosen as a teen, and he defeated a Goliath. He was chosen as a king, as, as uh, King Saul, as an armor bearer. He was actually a musician for Saul to help calm the demons that bothered King Saul. Loved by the army, married to the king's daughter, and then life happened. Everybody say, life happened. I can't tell you how quick life can happen, how, how things can turn around very quickly. And David began to move from one place, and now he's heading to the next place. He lost his job. From a jealous king, he lost his income, his security, he lost his wife. She was given to another. He fled to Rama to see his mentor, Samuel, who he had to, he wanted to reconnect with him. He was cut off by Saul's army. Again, the jealousy began to be exposed. He loses fellowship with his best friend, Jonathan. He feigned madness before his enemy, amen, being, uh, seeking refuge from that mad king. First Samuel chapter 21, are you comfortable? What a place to end up. Well, I mean, if, you, if you'd have asked David as a young man, David, where do you see your life going? I'm heading up. 
I'm going up, man. I'm moving. But sometimes life will plane out on you. You want to go up. You want to see that line upon line, precept upon precept, from glory to glory. But then there's that in-between times, that place where things just kind of plane out. And you wonder, where did God go? What happened? I mean, I was rocking, man. I took out the Goliath. I, I, I was married to the king's daughter. They were singing my praise. Life was great and glorious. And then all of a sudden, one man's attitude began to affect me. I'm running for my life. I'm dodging spears. I, I'm trying to hide out. I don't know where else to go. I think, and David, I use this phrase kind of loosely, but he became a little bit of a scandalous saint. Not saying that any of you would be this way, but, but he became a little bit scandalous in the sense that he feigned madness. In other words, he faked it. Have you ever had to fake it? No, don't answer that. Don't look around. Look straight toward me, please. I mean, you know, we, we, he just went into this, this mode where I've got to do something. I've got to survive. I've got to make it. If I'm ever going to thrive, I've got to survive. So he goes into the enemy camp, and the Scripture says, David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. Now, when I say Gath, you understand Gath. Goliath was from Gath. So this is where Goliath's home death. So you, you know, look, you killed the number one NFL prospect, the main guy of Gath, and now you plan on going to live there? Woo. So he pretended to be insane in their presence, and while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. Now, I know all you guys understand marking something. I'll leave it right there. Achish said to his servants, look at this man. He is insane. Why well, bring him to me? I mean, he got spit running down his beard. He's acting all weird. He said, am I so short of madmen that you have to bring this fellow here to carry on like this in front of me? Must this man come into my house? So he allowed him to come in and be a part. Uh, as a matter of fact, he decided because David had feigned madness, we're just going to let him live. This is the, the, the hero of Israel. We're going to make fun of him and laugh at him. But what he didn't know was David began to acquire opportunities to go out and raid the Philistines and raid against them. He would go out. They thought he went one place. He wouldn't let anything live when he went there. And he would take out the enemy. Then he would come back. David was moving from place to place. Life is place to place. Amen. And, and I, I'm praying your next place is better than this place. Can I get an amen? I'm not talking about your physical where you're at right now, but spiritually as you grow in God. Father, I'm asking you to elevate us. We're in a plane right now. We, we sense that, 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 that line upon line. We're in the upon times of life. And when in so doing, we ask that we get elevated, we move up quickly. But Lord, while we're here, let us learn some lessons in Jesus' name. And everyone sit. Amen. God bless you. you. May be seated. David's next, next place. In other words, he, he went not just to the next place, but the next, next place. When he ran, he went to the cave. If there's one thing I've learned in life is these cave experiences have been good experiences for me. Uh, when I say cave, uh, we, we use a phrase among the men, men, a man cave. We got a man cave. In other words, it's just, just a place to go. Women have the same thing. It's a place that you can be alone with God, a place where you can learn, a place where you can get serious with him. Saul's bitterness toward David began to affect him. Words that became swords. Say, say, you know, it, it happened to him over and over. First Samuel 22, the scripture says, David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him. He became their leader. About 400 men were with him. To me, this is, if, if you've not heard me talk about this before, my life, in some senses, have mirrored a little bit of David's. But on the other side, I'm very humbled to say that there are times you go to a cave, you go to a private place, and all of a sudden people start finding you. If there's anything I learned in this passage is, his, his, the Scripture says that his, his family found him. But when he got to the cave, he wasn't Mr. Victory. He had feigned madness. He had lived among the enemy. He had embarrassment upon, upon his life. Uh, he, he didn't know what else to do. And in trying to escape, he began to complain. And David would write his complaints down. And I don't know if you write complaints down, but it's okay. God doesn't get upset when you complain. Now, don't write it on Facebook. 
Write it out and give it toward God. Give it to him. He wrote in Psalm 142, I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out my complaint before him. Before him, I tell him my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who knows my way. You know my line upon line, my precept upon precept, my glory to glory. In the path where I walk, men have hidden a snare for me. Look to the right and see. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. I cry to you, O Lord, saying you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Set me free from my prison that I may praise your name. See, I believe some folk are so close to getting out of prison that they could give God a little praise in the house. Amen. You're that close. You know, that's what David's saying. My passion in life is to give you praise when the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. David wrote this in the cave. He said, you know why I'm here? I want to give God some praise. I need a little help. Those that are chasing me are too strong for me. I can't handle it. Matter of fact, right now I am by myself. Somebody said, you know what the loneliest by you is in Louisiana? By yourself. Amen. You get there in that place, and that's where he was. And when he got there, he began to receive divine encouragement and appointments. I believe in divine appointments. I believe there are times I walk along in life and I say, God, who's next? And I'll meet somebody and it was an absolute, it, they, there's somebody that made your baby jump. There's somebody you connected with. There's somebody been through the same thing you went through. So here's David. He's in the cave. Let me tell you about David. He's discontent. He's in debt. He's discouraged. And all of a sudden, there's a knock at the door. Maybe it was a cave or whatever. But the cave is where God does some of his best work in molding and shaping human lives. It ain't, it ain't all the glorious things. It's that time when God can get you alone. There's something about solace. There's something about solitude. There's something about when God can get you into a place where he begins to work on you. The word Adullam, the cave of Adullam, means testimony. In other words, when I come out of here, I'm going to have something to say about why I was in here. We would call it a public profession of an experience with Jesus. The book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 11 says, They overcame him through the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Some of you have never used your testimony. You got to start sharing your testimony. What did Jesus do for you? Amen. The blood is what he's already done. The word is when I'm standing on my profession. I'm telling you what he did. In 1979, of November the 10th, I was a, I was somebody far from God. But just like that, I was connected with him. My life became born again. And then I found myself in a series of cave events. All through my life, for 40 years, I have been in and out of the cave. The cave is like some place I, I, I get to go. And when I'm there, I say, God, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. And God begins to mold and begin to work on your life. He brings you to a place of shaping. Amen. It's not curtains. It's the cave. It's not the end. It's actually a new beginning. It's the next place. Everybody say the next place. Amen. He begins to convert. Things begin to convert in your life. This is usually the place that you want no one around you. There's nothing... Uh, wrong with being alone if you can learn how to handle being alone. I'm not talking about loneliness. I'm talking about alone. And when you can learn how to be alone without having anybody, and I, I'm, I'm not speaking about uh, against marriage, that, that God brings people together. He gives you help meets, people to bless you and help you and strengthen you. That's good. But there's a time when God pulls you away from all, your, all of these things, the crutches, and begins to work on you. The first group that showed up was Daddy. Daddy and his sons. David left Gath, escaped to the cave of Adullam. Then his brothers and his father's household heard about it. They went down to him. It wasn't long ago till Daddy didn't even recognize that David was God's anointed. It wasn't long ago did the brothers put David down for showing up to kill Goliath. You remember the story that, uh, 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 go to the next slide, sis. Amen. Come on, go to the next one. Uh, then, then Eliab, David's brother, you remember this is David getting there with the cheese to take care of the brother and the bread. He shows up on the battlefield after 40 days. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. 
This is what it was his brother's reply to him. So David had, you don't got family members like that. You ain't got a sibling that is jealous of you. You don't have a sibling that looks at you as conceited, that looks at you as being favorable, looks at you that everything you touch is turning to gold, that you wear Joseph's favorite colored coat. You ain't got siblings like that, and you're not a sibling like that. Don't look around at me. I'm telling you that everybody got family members that at one time or another that goes through this type of, of, of feeling. I've had it. You've had it. We've all had it. It doesn't make any of us right or wrong. It's life in the family. It's just that way. And then you'll have cousins that are that way or, or other people that are close to you. So they looked at David, and they, they, they began to put him down. They said, you showed up here just to show off. Well, what are you doing? Then David kills Goliath. You know it. So he gets elevated very quickly. He goes from place to place real fast. But now his brothers are off. At a, we don't hear nothing about Jesse. We don't hear nothing about the brothers. They just back off into the distance. They fade away. Now the story's about David. It's about Saul. It's about Israel. And now David goes through all of these victories in life. Life, and he ends up in this place in a cave. <clears throat> in the cave, daddy showed up and the brothers. There are times in my life that my brother will call me. My brother and I have had outs. He's one year younger than me. We have fought like two grown men. Fist fight, bloody. My dad would uh, promote it. You know, there was a time when my dad got tired of whooping us. He would bend us over a hassock. Y'all know what a hassock is? A footstool? We had an orange hassock. I'll never forget this orange hassock. It had grip marks in it. When my brother and I laid across it and gripped the other ends of it and stared at each other face to face, my daddy would whoop us, Frank, like this. He'd rear back that belt, and he'd watch which one tensed that hiney up and hit the other one. You say that's cruel. I, I don't know what, like we didn't have, my dad didn't have a book that said Raising Kids 101 or anything like that. We didn't have that educational thing. Like, my dad just figured if you did wrong, look, one of y'all did it. One of y'all did it. I don't know which one did it. Neither one of you confessed. You're covering one another, so I'm going to whoop you both. <laughs> and he would wear us out. We got older, he quit doing it. He said, y'all just fight. He just say, fight. Get out there and fight. And we'd go to, we'd go to blows. We'd go to fight. And this is the way we came up. And then we hit a place in life where we were good friends, and then we went place to place, and then it happened again, the jealousy issue. You know, he, he saw what was, God was doing in my life, and we had a big fight over it. And I realized what a blessing he was to my mom and dad to be there to help take care of them as they got older. And I, I recognized his place in life. And I began to back away. But there's been a time that I've been in the cave where shame had covered me, hurt had covered me, uh, all of these things, and there was a knock at the door, and it was my daddy and my family. There ain't nothing like having families. You say, Pastor, that ain't happened for me yet. I'm praying that it will. But there has to be humility on your part to be able to receive them when it happens. You can't be arrogant and blow up. And you got to own it. Uh, my friend, when this thing happened in my life, you know, do you remember? Some of you might remember. I baptized. My dad got saved. My mama got saved. My brother got saved. My sister got saved. My, my cousins got saved. I baptized every one of them in a swimming pool 17 years ago. Amen. Just dunked them all. And I watched that, that, those cave moments. This ain't something I read about in the Bible. This is something I walked through. It's something that I recognize. So here's David in the cave. He gets Eliab. He gets his brothers. He got his daddy. They all in the cave with him. And then the scripture says the distressed people started showing up. Oh, they ain't nothing like starting a church and distressed people show up. Under pressure, stressed out, they just want to show up. Oh, God, please send me people got money. We're going to start a church. We're going to do something out of this cave. If we're going to start a move of God out of this cave, send me folk. I got some money. The third group showed up. They were in debt. <laughs> Look at them. In debt. To lend on interest, to have a number of creditors. You didn't show up here. You were chased up in this cave. They are hunting you in this kid. Don't answer that phone. They chased you up in here. Amen. I remember the first offer we took as a little country church. Some of you might remember this. It was a dollar. A literal dollar. I didn't try to make it happen. It was a dollar. We passed the plate, got one dollar. The next week I had everybody sign it. Somewhere on that camp is a dollar. 
with your signature on it. Amen. And in 16 years, all we've done is gone up, paid off two churches, and 115 acres of land. Amen. Can we give God a little praise for that? We've just place to place to place, moving up a place, he heading a little bit higher. But they were in debt. They showed up in debt. They, then the fourth group, the Scripture says that, that they were discontented. I, I've, people always go through times of discontent. To be in bitterness of soul, to have, to have been wrong, mistreated. Uh, it, you got to beware of a victim mentality. It tries to jump on you. It tries to hold on to you. So here's David in the cave. He's already discouraged a little bit. He's already in debt. He's already uh, got, got issues going on. And his daddy shows up. His family shows up. Those discontent, in debt, discouraged, shows up in the cave. What are you going to do with them? The scripture says that David turned those people into mighty men. Mighty men. There's something about forging, coming together, connecting, realizing that we all got the same pain, we all got the same issues, but we got the same God. And he will not let us stay in this place, but he wants to move us to the next place. Can I get an amen? From place to place. Hallelujah. When your next place, then he starts becoming your ace. And this is what happened to David. It was a new start for a new ministry. This smelly, dark, dungeon cave became a training ground. This motley crew that, that doubted themselves became David's mighty men of valor. And again, the power of these guys was amazing. That they could take a, a stone with, a, with, a, with a, a sling and hit, a, you could pull a hair out like this, and they would break that hair, left hand, right hand, able to move spears, a, able to run through troops. They became a discipline, men of discipline with direction. They had a place. I've often said that the answer to loneliness it's not somebody else in your life. It's direction. If I have direction in life, it will defeat loneliness. Amen. For many of you have found yourself widower, widower, you, you have to find direction in life. You have to do that. If not, you stay lonely. You've got to keep moving forward. You've got to keep pressing forward. The cave from self-pity to great assurance, circumstances, situations, and other people, they haven't changed. What changed is attitude. Everybody say attitude. It's the only thing you can control. It's your attitude, how you perceive, how you see life. Amen. Your attitude has to change. It has to shift. The cave is where you end up when your props, supports, and crutches get stripped away. You're in total dependence of God. The cave is the place of shaping. It's not curtains. It's a cave. It's a time for a new start. The cave, perhaps foolish choices put you there. Or it's a result of circumstances you could not control or both. The cave is where God does some of his best work in molding and shaping our lives. The cave is where you discover that God is enough. The cave is where the anointing matters. The cave can take place after a, a, a financial problems, relational issues, all of those things. But God always has this place for us. And here's what I found out about David. He was more comfortable in the cave than he was in the palace. He wrote his best songs in the cave. When things are going good, when prosperity is blessing you and things are rocking, oh, it, it, I, was, I was mowing grass, I was thinking about this the other day, just how blessed we are as Americans. And, and now we're entering in this political season. And some of you are getting real political. I've been noticing. Be careful. Can I tell you something? The church will grow no matter who's president. Amen. We're going to keep on growing. We're going to keep on expanding. Because, because that, that just, that's just leadership way out there in a place. It's a foreign land to me. They don't even know what's going on in Texas. They don't. It's way out yonder in Washington somewhere. And I think that's on it's the D.C., not the state. When I was in school, I thought they were the same. I didn't know. Didn't care. The issue is simply this. I, I know that God still has things in control. Amen. When I go to the cave, God begins to work in our life. When, when the church is being persecuted, the church grows. When, when they start putting pressure on us, all of a sudden we start showing up. When everything's easy, we just kind of sit back. David, the scripture says, had a new song of David when he pretended to be insane before King Ahimelech. who drove him away and he left. Psalm 34. He wrote this while in the cave. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt, <coughs> let us exalt his name together. Amen. Together. He's talking to those that were in distress, those in debt, those discontented, and all of daddy's bunch. Let us, all of us. Everybody say us. 
us is us. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. This place prepares us for the next. Remember now, guys, the circumstances didn't change. Saul was still trying to kill him. He still had no job. He still had no wife. He still had no home. His Ford was still broke down. What changed? David did. His attitude went from Psalm 142, which we read in verse 4. Look to my right and see no one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for me. To this, I will extol the Lord at all times. Here he's writing these, and, and when he says, I'll extol him at all times, his praise will always be in my, on my lips. And by the way, when you're reading through the Psalms, they're not in chronological order. Okay? So if you read Psalm 142... Actually, David wrote 142 before he, before he wrote four, uh, 34. So, so keep this in mind. So when he gets to Psalm 34, he said, I'm going to lift up the Lord at all times. His praise is going to be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Let me say this to you. Give folk a little time. There are times that people look into the left and their right, and they, they're down they're a little upset. They, they may share it on, on, on social media. They, they, they may share it with you on the phone. But give them a little time to stay in the cave. Give them a little time for God to work on them. Give, I've learned this as a secret, man. It's a secret to solitude. Give folks some time. Don't belittle them, put them down, and beat them up because of a circumstance or situation they're in right now. Give them a little time. Amen. Give them a little time with Jesus and watch and see what happens. All of a sudden, things, God, God ain't going to leave them alone. He loved you too much. He loved them too much. He's not going to just say, okay, well, enough with you. I'll go to that. He's not going to do that. He's going to keep working on you. He's going to keep working on your spouse. He's going to keep working on your kids. Amen. And you got to start looking for a little bit of victory. Glorify the Lord, he said with me. Let us exalt his name. I want to exalt his name together. There's one thing for me to do it. There's another thing when I hear you do it, that we exalt his name together. The cave, the cave, the cave. See, I look at church sometimes as caves. I do, man. I come in here and I say, God, what do you want to do? My attitude could be messed up, mad, and I get in here and I get to worship in him with you. All of a sudden, my attitude starts shifting. Oh, I was mad at you. That's why I didn't shake your hand when I come in. Before church was over, I'm ready to hug your neck. Amen. God does some of his best work when his kids come together. Listen, guys, why do we change? First, we change when we hurt enough that we have to. David began to hurt. He admitted his need in Psalm 142. Rescue me from those who pursue me. Amen. I'm hurting. Help me. Change me. Second, when we learn enough. Ed Education is not a bad thing. Revelation is even greater. But when you, when you start learning, I want to be around people that have learned some things. When those folks started entering that cave, they, they weren't hunt, hunting for the great psalmist of Israel. They weren't hunting for the, uh, the giant slayer. They were just like David. They had been beat down. They were discontent. These guys were Benaiah. They were Joab. These were the men that rose up with him, Abishag, men who began to work with him and, 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 and uh, uh, stand beside him. They had been through things together. There, there's, there are times I look at people's lives and I, uh, there's almost a little envy because I know they've been through something and I watch how people are connected to them. I know it's happened in my life where people look at me and say, why do them people, why are they so loyal? Why do they bless you? Why are they with you? Because they've been through stuff with me. We've been through it together. And together forged us. It made us the church that we are. Amen. You learned. David had learned to be honest enough to cry for help. For they're strong against me. And the third point, the last point, would you stand with me? When you receive. When you receive enough that you're able to. Sometimes folk just need a little help. They just need to receive something. Been a blessed summer. Blessed summer. I've watched our children receive i've watched our youth receive i've watched people begin to receive are you able to humility will make you teachable arrogance will set you up for a fall haughtiness always before the fall but humility is the position of strength when i'm humble i'm teachable when i've gone through things i'm going to learn something my dad would 
I love my dad. And when I mentioned about him whooping us, you know, it's just my dad. I, I have I have covered my, my dad did things. I'm not gonna tell you about him. But he my daddy. Boy, and the, and the older I got, the more love I had for him. But there were times he would help us learn something. And he didn't know exactly how to say it. So he'd do something like this. Reach down and hold that spark plug. While I pull this lawnmower string. And tell me if you feel anything. Because I need to know if that thing getting sparked. So you reach down and get hold of that. And he have that little grin on his face. Y'all never did this, did you? And he pulled that string just enough that they give you a little pop. And then you'd smile and say, Daddy, it's got, it's got, it's got spark. He knew it had spark. That's why he did it. This is, this is how you learn through life when I can learn enough I learn there are things I've learned this is one of them I can't live without him I've got to stay connected to him when I'm connected to him there comes my strength David being pursued by a king spears words hides in a cave but he never forgot this one thing I got to stay connected I got to stay in contact I got to tell God my complaints. I got to see what he wants to do in my life next. To have my daddy and my family reconnect with me. To have people come back into my life. I don't know, was he connected with those guys before? I don't know. But he turned them into mighty men. He became a leader. Leadership, my friend, is not something you learn at college. Leadership is something you learn in the cave. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. The conversion of a soul is the miracle of the moment. Oh, when God turns somebody's life around, it's the miracle of the moment. But the making of a saint, well, that takes a lifetime. It's going to take a lifetime. It's going to take from place to place, from line upon line, precept upon precept, from glory to glory. And many of us are called in that in-between times. I'm telling you right now, if you're in between, just go ahead and lift your hands up. You know you in between time. Father, in Jesus' name, those hands that are lifted, my prayers to strengthen them. Help them understand family's coming. Strength is coming. Lord, the people you've added to their life, their lives are changing too. Lord, begin to change us and mold us for your glory. I thank you for all the good things come from you. And we're moving from place to place. With those heads still bowed and eyes closed, if you've been away from God, would you also put your hand up? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Those hands that are lifted, let's pray this together. Lord Jesus, this day is a special day. It's the day you made. So I accept you as my Savior, my King. Forgive me my sins. Wash them away. Give me strength to live for you every day. I thank you for your mercy, your grace. For the experiences I've had in the cave. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise in here.